listeners and readers of awardswatch.com this is the awards watch podcast episode 340 or 243 wow i'm trying to jump ahead 100 episodes um i'm your executive editor ryan mccoy joining me today is our editor-in-chief eric anderson hello it's me and our television editor tyler doster hello it's me (laughs) what are you doing here um talking about movie things um but uh, also just we're here to talk about some of the best stuff of the year so far. And we'll talk about that. Eric and I are going to talk a little bit of Deadpool Wolverine, Eric's uh, most anticipated movie of the year. And we are, we're going to talk about Venice because the Venice film festival lineup dropped and TIFF TIFF dropped too. Um, a lot of TIFF news dropped. So, <laughs> but first, and, 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 uh, and uh, what else, what else, what else uh, happened? This week, what do you mean? I thought we're going to talk about next, right? First, no, that's what we're talking about first. Okay. Why don't you let me transition it normally? Hey, you know, or I'm just here to help. You're just stepping on my on my toes with your no, hobby feet. I'm, I'm just greasing the wheels. All right. Well, the big news today was that we have a new film entering the awards race that we weren't considering. Um, but we didn't really think it was going to be ready in time. I didn't think it was going to be ready in time. I thought it was going to come out next year. Uh, and that's James Mangold's A Complete Unknown. And if you don't know what that is, it's the Timothy Chalamet playing Bob Dylan biopic. And the first trailer dropped today in all of its misery, glory, however you want to describe it. And um, so, Eric, what did you think of the uh, trailer for A Complete Unknown? Well, first, I mean, yeah, there there were definitely some, like, rumors that it might be able to be out by the end of the year if the post-production was going to be able to be fast enough and i think searchlight started looking at their at their lineup and they've got a real pain they've got night bitch but kinds of kindness sort of just came and went and went with it any best actor hopes and i think they i think they told mangold you need to get your your foot pedal to the metal and get this out so yeah i mean a few days ago you know it was discovered that the trailer had been rated and how long it was and that was really all you needed to know that that wheel was in motion and it's it's funny because the trailer looks exactly like all of the paparazzi pictures that we've seen i was gonna say he's walking down those streets that's all it is is chalamet just walking around new york city yeah uh and then we do of course get his his own singing uh which not a surprise but i i was happy that they had it in there Mm -hmm. um and it was uh, a hard rain's gonna fall and sounded really good. I'm visually not like super, super excited. I love Feet on Papa Michael, but every bit of this had the same kind of brown hipster hue. I can't, I don't know what else to call it, but everything, it just felt like Bushwick. Mm-hmm. Well, I and, mean, that's the vibe they're trying movie. to get off. Yeah, yeah which is... Uh, Fair to the, fair to their point. I mean, yeah. Tyler, did you watch the trailer this morning? I did actually. You have, I, th- you have thoughts on it? Are you big Bob? You're a bit the biggest Bob Dylan fan I know. Yes, um, so I, I thought I was like, you know, if anyone's opinion on this, I really wanted to know was Tyler Doster. Um, so my Tyler, alarm is a Bob Dylan song. There you go. <laughs> Which one is it, Tyler? Uh, that's not your business. <laughs> <laughs> It's the Bob Dylan song for sure, though, so don't worry about it, Ryan. Okay, all right, for sure, for sure. Um, So what did you think of it? So I actually, I think I watched it because I was surprised, like kind of Eric just said, I was surprised it came out, and I saw a lot of people on the internet had that same sentiment. Um, It seemed like Searchlight was like, well, we've had stuff in the past few years, and other than these couple of things, like it's time to throw something else in the ring. Um, I think putting timmy in anything and putting it at the forefront of award season is always going to get it some attention now we will obviously be waiting for screenings to come in before we can really see how people will be thinking about that performance and um 
everything else going on with it, but it looks fine. I'll watch it, but I wasn't losing my mind over it or anything like that. It didn't look spectacular, but it looked fine. I loved it just as much as you did, Ryan. I think it was one of the worst trailers of the year. I think that looks like an abomination. Um, an absolute travesty of a film. Um, it's covering a topic that we've already seen before many times. And I can't believe that they drugged Bob Dylan and got his approval for this. It feels like um, it's really bold for the man that made a really flat, bland musical biopic that was walked the line and then got literally dragged across concrete with walk hard to the point in which the genre had to die for like 10 years to then put it, his chips in the middle of the table after a financial disaster, like the dial of destiny to then say, I'm going to go back to this and then have a rush job with Timothy Chalamet, who doesn't look anything like Bob Dylan, who sounds like he's singing mostly still in his Wonka voice than he is actually Bob Dylan. And yeah, I think, I think it looks terrible. I think that the, um, the, the wigs, Tyler's a big fan of wigs. I think the wigs look awful. I think the cinematography looks terrible. I don't know what Ed Norton's doing. Um, I was mostly like looking in an Eric Anderson mirror. Um, but um, I think that it's going to sadly though, be in the conversation because Searchlight is an amazing team behind them. Always every single year, they're able to push crap that I don't even like some of the time and still get a bunch of nominations um, maybe it'll be a real pain. Maybe it'll be night bitch, hopefully. Um, but that's the thing about James Mangold is, you know, we've seen this era covered with a movie like Inside Lewin Davis, or we've uh, seen, you know, I'm Not There, which this is an extraordinary film from Todd Haynes. And that has a visual understanding and also a, a, a point of view that other than just like, I'm going to tell the rise and only the rise of Bob Dylan. I'm not going to talk about the other eras in his life. I'm not going to talk about the transformations and the various genres that he molded and, and changed. I'm just going to talk about when he was playing a little acoustic guitar and came up and that's it. So I wish this movie um, actually no success. Um, and I can't wait to review it on the website. And um, it makes me really nervous for the Bruce Springsteen film that's going to come out in a couple of years because i think that the reason why everybody went crazy over this is because chalamet is a movie star and yet this movie looks like it's super commercializing one of the biggest rebels in music history and <laughs> that's a little weird too um so yeah i i don't i know it's only a two minute trailer but i'm i felt really sick in my stomach watching it and um thank god gladiator comes out a month before so then I don't have to watch cinema die. Fascinating commentary from <laughs> Ryan McQuaid, AKA Texas's JD Vance. <laughs> well done. Well done, Ryan. I think my Ryan, I don't think you understood what we were talking about. We just wanted real opinions on the trailer. Oh, okay. Uh, here you go. Um, that was like a movie review. That was longer than the trailer. Yeah. It's, oh. it was better than the trailer to be fair. Um, I also hated the fact that like, I mean, the song choice was fine, but then also like, duh, they have to then play the opening to like a Rolling Stone, right? As you're about to go to the title card, it's like, oh, cause we didn't know what this movie was about. Makes us real, like we're idiots. So yeah, this year has been a really rough year uh, for movies. And I think that this is just like the, the terrible present that we're going to get at the holiday season. So, um, Make It'll sure be in theaters. I, make sure I'm on any podcast where this is going to get brought up. I want <laughs> this firsthand every time. <laughs> Honestly, um, anything that's going to make Ryan this upset, I am kind of here for it. Of. I'm here Always. for it. So I'm going to champion this movie to be th the worst movie of the year or the best movie of the year. Either. I'm fine with either. I can't wait for the double bill of this and here. Um, cause that's just going to be my nightmare. That'll be, yeah, that'll be a rough day for a watch. Anyway, a lot of people 
who have never probably been invested in Bob Dylan's life at all seem really excited about it on the internet. I'm going to make it their identity. Wonderful. Can't wait to see it. Can't wait to hear it. Anyway, movies that we are excited about are the lineup of Venice. And there was also even more titles added for the Toronto International Film Festival. So we are starting to see what we're going to, Eric and I are going to possibly see at Telluride, as well as also possibly see at New York later this year. And, uh, but Eric, you covered the news of both of these in the morning. What were the kind of big standouts for you from this, I think, ginormous and wonderful lineup at Venice again, back to back years, giving me big FOMO. And then the kind of surprises I think that happened from TIFF, like hard truths from Mike Lee showing up at TIFF rather than at Venice and other festivals. That's that's very curious. So what did you think about these festival announcements this past week? Yeah, Venice is just going to be one of those years again that is as like star fuckery as possible. It is like a list only. It's it's pretty incredible. It's a, it's a great lineup. It's pretty rude, also the kind of the films that they selected in terms of you know people were you know with, there's the Angelina Jolie Maria film that'll be in contention also with Wolves in the same week from you know and all that. But they they're going all out because the strike was last year and they didn't really get to have every star show up. Some movies. Uh, even uh, delayed. I believe that they mm-hmm. talked about that Dune was on their list, or they usually have a big blockbuster. But they have, they have Joker Folly Ado and all the, and uh, they they have Queer, and they have pretty much every big director in the sun going to this thing with their stars. Yeah, I mean the the majority of the competition titles weren't exactly surprises. By the time we got to the announcement, we had a pretty good idea. And there were certainly things that we knew were going to be there, like Maria and and Queer and Joker. Uh, so, you know, that's just going to bring all of these great images uh, of Angelina Jolie and Lady Gaga, you know, on their little boats as they love go the little boats. The um, and it's it's there. There's just no other place really like it for for festival uh, attention. But it's it's cool. We've got uh, the Brutalist from Brady Corbett, very star studded. It's also three hours and forty five minutes long, so that is going to test a lot of patience uh, in in so many ways. I can't. Yeah, I can't even imagine. Tyler entering that theater. Uh and Tyler, not- by the way, that can watch 12 hours straight of a drama and be totally fine. But yeah, you know, movie. You already know. Yeah. Not the same thing. That would have to be the that would have to be totally the first is. Movie I watched of the entire festival for me to yeah. go through it to make yeah. it. Otherwise, yeah. I'd fall asleep during it. Yeah. <laughs> I'll sit I'll sit next to you and nudge the shit out of you to wake you up. How about that? You know I'd scream. No. <laughs> it's not a horror movie, but yes, you would. I'm, I'm uh, just very happy. We there's also a uh, baby girl, uh, from Bodies, Bodies, Bodies director Helena Rijen, uh, with Nicole oh, Kidman. That's Nicole who's Kidman. doing that. Absolutely, okay. uh, having another fantastic year because that's all she does is win, win, win. She's just with every young man right now in every movie. She's just like Zac Efron, She's living the dream. Yeah, she's like, sorry, Keith. Yeah. Good Absolutely. for her. Good for her. It's always a good for her moment, to be honest. Yeah. Every time I see her cast alongside a hot young actor. <laughs> well, and also, Eric, too, we did find out the opening night film for NYFF. That's going to be the Nickel Boys. Um, yes, we we do have that. Uh, and then, as we know, with the the designations given to the Toronto films, uh, that tells us what we need to know. Not completely, but in in a large part uh, of of what can show up at Telluride, and in, including uh, Venice artistic director Al, Al Bilt- Alberto Barbera uh, revealed a little bit of the scheduling, which has not come out yet for Venice, uh, and that is that a handful of these films are going to be in the second 
half of the schedule of the festival, mm-hmm. which has total overlap with Telluride. Telluride is yeah. only three days. So that means that queer is not going to Telluride. Maria is not going to Telluride. Uh, or no, uh, the room next door. The room next door. Maria is, uh, is in contention. Possibly yeah, Maria still. is. Uh, yeah, room next door is not. Uh, so that's that's kind of where that's at. Yeah. Um, but then also, too, uh, it looks like there's a bunch of titles that we can already guess. We're not going to do that on this episode, obviously, yeah. for sure. But uh, that it looks like there is going to be a, at least a really good handful of um, of world premieres at um i tell you right that'll be really interesting i forgot to ask you eric when we were talking about uh, that bob dylan movie um i know that there's some people online they're like will it be ready in time for anything i do not believe that is just going to be a straight december release i believe correct because they'll have it, night it feels like it um yeah, unless it's like a late break or like a, a new york or a maybe an afi I doubt I, it. I, I hope not. I hope there's, I don't know. AFI premieres are, are kind of a red flag. Well, yeah. I mean, that's where I'm, I've got the hope for her for here. Yeah. That's totally feels like an AFI movie opening night. Um, But I don't know if it, it feels like it, it could just easily be a December release and that's it. Yeah. I mean, I saw a couple of the rumblings of, uh, I think I saw one that said it could be a Telluride. I'm like, shh, okay. Yeah. I mean, if, if it, it if it is cool, if I mean, yeah, that would be great. That would that would can't be, wait to review it. It feels it feels uh, ambitious. Yeah, it would be for a movie that doesn't feel like it's fully finished in the edit. Um, no, but there are it. there are definitely several, and you know, with every festival, they get approved before there is even a final cut. Yeah. And we know with almost every festival as well, some films uh, aren't even finished until days before. Well, uh, I mean, some films we've seen it before where some films premiere and then they change their cuts of their films. Definitely. So that's that's, that's so, a little different. That's I know, but different. I'm just saying is that, you know, they it there's it's always changing. It's never settled until it's released. Yeah. So, um, well, that would be really interesting, but I'm really excited by a lot of these. I am disappointed. If um, the 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 president of Venice is correct, and they are going to have you know, and let, I mean, he's a little sneaky guy. He's a sneaky dude. Uh, he could be doing misdirection, so you never know. Um, uh, and also, things might change though because it's not finalized. But um, I am I desperately want to see queer. That's very high on I think yours and my list, and oh, yeah. everybody's at the team's list uh, because we all love Luca and. He also felt like somebody that could potentially get a tribute over at Telluride. And so um, maybe we well, don't know, no, but it's not looking that way. Um, but uh, very excited to see uh, a lot of these films and we'll have more on that in the coming weeks. Um, the big film this weekend is Deadpool Wolverine. Uh, Eric has been telling me all week, week, I got to talk about Deadpool Wolverine. I got to talk about it. I got to talk about it. What? I got to talk about it. And I'm like, Eric, calm down. We'll talk about it on the show. So we're here and we're going to talk about it. Tyler, unfortunately, has not seen it. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, he's going to drive out of state to see it. Um, mm-hmm. um, but Eric, you and I were able to see this early along with pretty much every other critic in the world. So take notes Warner brothers with trap that, you know, critics like seeing movies ahead of time. Um, so what did you think of this um, film? I guess is what you could call it. Cause it feels more like a bunch of things that were very well highlighted in our review up on the website by Jay Ledbetter, which this feels like a film. It feels like a nostalgia fest. It feels like something made out of a factory. What do you think, Eric? I mean, I, I pretty much agree with with Jay's review and I'm I'm really right down the middle with it. It is probably the most masturbatorial movie I think I've ever seen. Ever seen? It's like ever. Like hmm. it's it's like even more than gay porn. There's more masturbation in this than in gay porn. Interesting. To the point where half of the jokes in this 
in very traditional Deadpool or dick jokes style are gay homoerotic jokes and yeah. just nonstop. And you know, sometimes it's funny. Sometimes it's you, you're you're like, wait, so who is the audience for this that is taking these jokes and what do they take from them exactly? Um, but there was some funny stuff. It's it's also a movie that is so desperate, really desperate, that there are a thousand jokes an hour just being thrown at you. And when they when they land, they're pretty funny. The audience that I was with was a, a big audience, and there was definitely uh more more than half that just landed flat with no laughs and understandably so you also do have to come in with a pretty deep bench knowledge or amount of information of marvel content across films and television because uh loki and the tva features quite heavily into it um as well as characters just from multiple things and that's not even including like the cameos which i will say i thought were really really good for a series that is obsessed with cameos and bringing you know people from all different marvel properties together what what they do here is probably the best version of it but even then it's still such a weird fan service so it gets to the point where the whole movie really is just fan service there isn't a movie there exactly yeah i i'm with you and jay in the middle on this i think that it's a f- kind of fascinating artifact of a movie because it is speaking to eric i think the m- kind of questions that we are asking as film goers right now and what an audience wants and this movie kind of gives everything to you without actually answering what's the best for you and i don't think giving you everything is the right thing i think that this movie at times is very sentimental it's very sentimental to the fox properties that disney acquired i actually thought that was the best part of this movie is Marvel could and any other studio. I mean, obviously look at Warner brothers and how Zasloff is handling every single property that they have under the sun right now, just slashing things, not caring, literally had an entire movie or two movies, mind you, not even releasing them. This kind of feels like a love letter to that and understanding of that helps that Feige kind of came from that era. And that's where the MCU was born out of. Uh, There was a deep respect for those characters and those arcs and for obviously the character Wolverine, which I don't think we have an MCU if the X-Men don't exist and are very popular. And Hugh Jackman's been at the forefront of all this for a long, long time. And I think Jackman's pretty good, even though the storyline where him is a pretty basic storyline through and through. Ryan Reynolds and, and Jack Jackman is also like acting like he is in a different movie. Yeah, he's he's his he's acting like this is like everything is an Oscar clip for him. Yeah, I think I th- I think it's very midnight run between the two of them when they're just on their quest. And it's it's fun. Um, I think Reynolds, his mileage is t- it varies on you depending on how far he goes into his shtick. I think when he's, it's not shtick. That's just like, I mean, that's, that's who he is now. He's fully formed into that person. And he's, and he is, he is Deadpool. Deadpool least, is him. Yeah. It's one of my least favorite. Yeah. But he was Deadpool before he was Deadpool. Yeah. And now he's just made it into. Yeah, exactly. This is, totally this is the same person he was in waiting. Everything. Yeah. And, and everything else. So he just, and Wilder he, and, yeah, he landed on that personality and basically took it into every single film. And, it works for a lot of people. It's it's a it's it works and it's great. I can't, you know, deny it. Yeah. I mean <laughs> I uh I think that um he's yeah. Um 
I, I I'm not like the biggest fan of his of since. Oh but no, I, th- I can't stand him. Um, but <laughs> I think that he. Um, uh, but uh, no, I I get that people really like him and and love these characters and love him in this, and he has been sort of the. The interesting thing about Deadpool is they've been the anti Marvel is that they've been able to do kind of similar films, but be able to take you they know can say jo- fuck, but they can't say or show cocaine. Yeah, <laughs> but My they God, can. How many times is that joke in this movie? About Holy six God. or seven times. Yeah, it's a lot. Um, but that but, said, Leslie Uggams is super, super. She's fun. super great. She's great I in all these fun. movies, and they're yes. also able to make fun of themselves, which is there's a couple of jokes about. Not Ryan Reynolds specifically. There's jokes about Jackman and like his personal life in this movie. And I'm was even Both shocked that their, they went and it was lives. it was hilarious. There's like a, a this was like a joke about like he won't take out the suit because of the of the way he looks post the divorce. And my mm-hmm. mouth was on the floor because I was like, damn, that's even they they did not mind going after Marvel and themselves. And I kind of give them credit for it. Visually speaking, this movie looks uh, horrid. Uh, I think Sean, uh, uh, what is, Sean Levy is a terrible director, and a, specifically the opening action sequence uh, is terrible. Like one of the worst things I've seen this year, easily. It, it it got significantly better, but sitting through that opening, I thought I was scared. Wow, this yeah. is this is what we're this is it. Okay, yeah. It, it was if me. if we had stayed in the same. Uh, sort of visual language of that opening title sequence throughout the rest of the movie, which looked like a YouTube video from fan service. Um, I probably would say that this is one of the worst movies of the year. And it luckily does not. Uh, thank God Marvel's like, no, we can actually like help you with a decent effects and a cinematographer. Um, but yeah, but the thing, the thing about movies that make fun of themselves is it's really a bit of a trick because yeah. it's trying to get away from uh being made fun of by other people mm-hmm. when they do it first it's like a, a person that is self-deprecating in their humor it's like i'm gonna say you know something shady about myself before you have a chance to say it to me mm-hmm. and there it's a it's a defense mechanism that is <laughs> this group would know nothing about that by really the way. obtrusive uh because then it becomes a shield yes well Well, it's a shield from criticism in this case and it's like and it's like you're right eric like i think like 65 to 60 percent of the jokes work and the rest of them are like okay let's just move along this movie is obsessed with talking and mentioning cancel culture but it's like you're still going to do things anyway and say whatever you want like why are you commenting on this it's 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 like it's speaking to a different part of the country and world. And it's like, it's it, you're derailing your movie. Just move along. Um, yeah. I thought the cameos, like you mentioned, uh, there's one in particular. My mouth was on the floor and you know, it takes a lot to kind of shock me uh, when it comes to this stuff. Cause I'm just like, yeah, I get it. It's, you know, a bunch of comic book stuff. Uh, I was genuinely shocked and I was super for it. Um, and it made sense. And everything I, I would say it, of because my, my, my audience was extremely vocal during mine too. And this is with some, critics during some. Yeah. During some of these these cameos, which is, you know, kind of cool. There is a certain element of that where even if it's not your style and, and not your bag. Being in. A room where it is for other people there is a i can i can i can understand it i can part of the moment i can feel it um uh, but i i also got very excited uh at well actually all of them were really good yeah they're pretty good but one in particular just knocked knocked. i think you and i have different ones i I think think we might have different ones but i did I, I like they were all great. I was kind of like, cool. And they were well used and also used as storyline and not simply just a, Hey, let's just pop you in here. Except for one. Yeah. Which oh, I kind of want to talk about. Yeah. No, we're going to leave. No, we're not going to do a, it. 
It's um, the funniest possible crossover that yeah. could have happened. Yeah. Um, but I do think the the best moment, the best visual joke, and the and the best moment, uh, because it's not going to be super spoily to mention this, but uh, you know, so Deadpool is going around trying to find Wolverine, who is dead. That's the opening. Um, because they're using because in his universe is the Fox universe, and that's of course Logan, yeah. where you know, which, which is why the TVA is is a part of all of this, and you know, you can go to multiple universes. Yes. So he goes around to like ten different universes yeah. with ten different that's pretty fun uh, Logan Wolverines, and they're really funny. But the first one with the tiny. Did you feel seen? Wolverine was so damn funny. And it's only because, and I didn't know this, you know, till I don't know, maybe a few years ago, that the character of Wolverine is super short. He's yeah, like he's five very short. Five or something. Yeah. Or five three. Hey, he's like um, your height. And for real, and I'm he, not joking. I'm not trying to make a joke. Called, I'm just no, like, I know. That's it's kind of great. You know. I was in like Harry Lou Retton, and I just <laughs> lost my mind. That yeah, was no. funny. No, that there, was there's good stuff. I mean, there's you know some other cameos later in the film that I think are a little just like, all right, you know, it's, it's throwing everything at the screen and seeing how much you can eat up within that, within the two hour runtime. I do think yeah. though, when the movie becomes very MCU more focused rather than just being about those two characters, I think that that's when I'm just like, okay, like this is, there's the Marvel. I know that I've grown tired of and can see a little bit of the machine. So yeah, um, that's where the movie kind of falls apart. Um, you know, and McCord I, is great, even though she's they, given a role with. Yeah, they're given. Yeah, they're only, given a, only. Yeah, they're given a role that's only and limited to a. A very narrow. Very loose thread to the Fox villain. universe as well, too, and, and everything. Yes. Matthew McFadden's yeah. doing the his best. I, I think he's. I thought he was great. Time. And I made a comment that he was like a less problematic Kevin Spacey. And I know at least one person that took that the wrong way. Cause what I meant was the character as a character. Type like that would be a Kevin Spacey, like a, a, a Kevin yeah. Spacey character from the nineties and early two thousands. Yeah. It felt like his character in baby driver where he's yeah, like, totally. yeah, yeah totally. Where, he, where he's like, I'm going to set this whole thing up, but I'm also, I've got alternative motives on the other end. See? Yes. That's why you need me around to help you out to explain things to people. No, um, Tyler, are you look, are you looking forward to Deadpool Wolverine based off no. our mixed conversation? Have you seen? Let me ask you a question. Have you seen a Deadpool movie? I have actually. I've seen the first two. Oh, okay. So you have. Okay. Well, Sophia has not, and so and she said she should to keep me, it that way. She should, yes. I think that that's actually she's the she's better than all of us on the editorial team. Um, You'll you'll go see it though, right, Tyler? Or you just wait till it's I won't on streaming? Go see it. I'll I'll probably watch it at home. My biggest problem with those movies is that they're kind of toothless to me. Um, yeah, that's I fair. Hoping for, I think what I'm really hoping for is like a for I I haven't seen anything about the cameos. I've seen a lot of people talking about them and such, but I'm hoping that um, Amy Adams as Night Bitch shows up as like the crossover of the year. I would be very excited. And I think that would be the perfect way to really gear up this campaign. I mean, that is a good way. It's great. That's great. Actually, that should have happened in the film. Um, maybe there's Four. another cut. superhero ready name, though. Maybe. Yeah. The, yeah right. Yeah. That's Night Bitch night over bitch. there. Yeah. Who's, Who's that in night the bitch? sky? It's Night Bitch. You know, like <laughs> running on all four. Running on all four. Yeah. Her, uh, her kryptonite is a bath. She's complaining about you know? motherhood and figuring it all out. Yeah. <laughs> It could be either her or Isabel Huppert as L. I think that I, would be. I'd be here for movie. that. I think I that'd think, be. She's so terrifying to me in anything she's in. You give night so bitch a milk really, bone. She goes like full zoomies, and then you know, yeah. Well, especially yeah. since she's a cat person. So well, there you go. That's fair. God, that's Tyler. That's, I'll never that's, forgive that's, you for saying full <laughs> zoomies about Amy <laughs> Adam as night bitch. That was maybe uh, the worst <laughs> thing you've said to me in years. <laughs> <laughs> that's how she's going to be on the campaign trail full zoomies um on all of the zooms um so deadpool wolverine it's going to make a shit ton of money um for eric's team 
Will it be enough to surpass Inside Out 2? We'll see. It will not. You but... got that purple crayon coming out next week, baby. Uh, Tyler, do you know what Harold and the Purple Crayon is? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. okay. You looking forward to that too? No. Okay. Well, well that's fair. Um, moving on. Best of the year so far. We're already past the halfway point, around the halfway point of the year. There's been an, uh, I'm I'm kind of curious what both of you think of the year of movies. Tyler, if you want to talk some TV, you can do that too. Um, but Eric, I'll start with you on this. Mm-hmm. What do you think of 2024 so far at this point? At this point last year, this weekend specifically was last year was the Barbenheimer uh, weekend. We had had past lives. We had had asteroid city. We'd had a bunch of films come out at festivals that we loved um, that premiered. We'd had films that premiered at can that obviously turned out to be some of our favorites of the year, like killers of the flower moon zone of interest, anatomy of a fall taste of things, May, December, bunch of stuff. Um, but from what you've seen so far this year is, is this like an, is this year on par to what I think last year, which was, was an amazing year in retrospect. Well, I mean, there are actually a handful of things this year that I have not seen and I definitely should have seen by now. Oh, like what are those? Well, that'll be revealed in this conversation uh, to my embarrassment. But um, it's weird because right at this point last year, uh, we were at the beginning of the strike of the the actor strike so um and i i think it was sort of obscured in a sense because of barbenheimer because they occupied so much box office conversation it seemed like it was just such a huge year and uh, it it was in that sense um but all the way through november which encompassed all of the fall film festivals that could not have talent you know, they they had a, a there was a quiet sense to them, and then some things that were held uh, for this year. To what you were talking about earlier, Challengers was supposed to play Venice, would have had a, a big splashy, super sexy premiere, uh, and Amazon said, "No, we can't. We're not going to do it because we're not going to be able to have, you know, the big Zendaya, Josh O'Connor, Mike Feist." on their little boats and red carpet moment um, and held it for April, which was such a wild and risky choice that ended up paying off. Um, so it, it felt like we, we've had good festivals. Sundance was good. South by Berlin can, but it feels like this first half of the year has been a little quiet. Um, and when I started looking at, Hey, what are my favorites of this year? That list was really small of things that I would really like to say, these are great films and my favorites and not just filling a list because I had to fill a list. It, it feels a little slight. I mean, we're at the end of July, I guess, thankfully, um, if we were cutting it off, a month earlier, it would be we would have been screwed. Even bleaker. Yeah. Um, Tyler, what do you think of the year so far? I mean, this is a great thing about this year, though. If I could say one great thing about this year was not only did I get to spend time with Eric early part of the year, but Tyler and I got to spend a bunch of time over at South by. So Tyler got to go to his first film festival this year and experience that and see a bunch of movies there. So I wonder, Tyler, if that helps you in your opinion on the year or not, um, seeing some of maybe your favorite films of the year at that setting there in in Austin. But uh, what do you think of the year so far? Um, I agree with Eric, to be honest. I feel like most of the year has been dominated by television so far, and I'm not just really saying that because that's what I do. Um, but it feels like most things right now, or at least in the first six months, have just revolved around so much television being premiered. Um, there are some movies, of course, at South By that I loved. Um, and there's other movies I've kind of seen. But other than that, 
there's not really anything for like last year where there's a hype train coming for really anything. And it feels like that since we don't have Barbenheimer a year later, it kind of feels, especially this July and the summer block, like blockbusters, it doesn't feel like we really have anything um, after we've gotten stuff like Barbenheimer, you know, Top Gun, and big stuff like that to make huge summer splashes. It feels like we're this year, we're not regressing, but it's just a little lighter. And hopefully the festival season will kind of um, give some weight to film season this year. You know, in usual years, I'm not where you guys are at because I, you know, we go to the festivals, we go to, you know, we watch stuff at, sundance at home or at the festival or we go to south by and there's stuff that's been held or there's been some really great stuff like i think again at this point last year we had seen past lives which is a phenomenal film we had seen asteroid city which is a great film you know we had seen you know, Barbenheimer and we had, you know, a great experience with that, but there were some good summer movies that happened last year as well, too. I think the problem with this year has been the inconsistencies with those blockbusters in the summer, like, like you were saying, Tyler, the lack of really any big explosion film out of Sundance or Sapa. I mean, there, there have been some, don't get me wrong. And we're going to probably talk about a couple of them. But there has not been a movie this year that I have ranked a four and a half out of five on Letterbox, And that's not good because usually there's at least one or two. So this year, I feel, has been obviously caused by the strike. Because if you look at some of the biggest films of the year that have been released, a lot of them were delayed because of the strike. Like even the big success of Dune part two, that movie was supposed to come out last October and people kind of forget about that. You'd mentioned challengers. There's going to be some other films that we talk about that were supposed to come out last year, but because of the strikes and Hollywood's and the studios, really the studios not budging, it costs them. And then therefore it's kind of cost us. So yes, the fall festivals, and that's why talking about Venice and TIFF and Telluride and all these places is so important because that's really where we're going to need this year to get picked up. Because the other thing was, is that a, a, there's a bunch of titles that are my favorite of the year. And those first time of experiences, we're seeing them with Eric at TIFF last year. There's a couple on my list here. That's like, I saw that at TIFF or I saw that at AFI last year. And then it got released this year. So I feel that 2023 is going to be looked back on in like five or 10 years is a really strong year and its branches extend all the way into this year as well. But, um, but there's still some good films to talk about. I think there's one film in particular that we'll all want to talk about because I think it is the movie so far of the year for all of us. And, um, and that's Madam web. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but like, what if it was, and we all agreed like I will say this about Madam Web, not to uh, throw any shade or anything towards it. That was one of the funnest uh, movie watching experiences I've had this year. I watched it at home, and that movie is stupid and wild. I don't know if either one of you have seen it. Oh but yes, it, of course. It, it is an event. Um, Tyler, you should watch that if you haven't. It's on Netflix. It's it's. I an- haven't seen it. I think it is. Um- it is so funny to ask Dakota Johnson to act in any way urgent. Like uh-huh. she has any sense of urgency about her. So I am excited to one day watch it, but we'll see when that'll be. You need like trash food and like a bottle of wine and just watch it. It's, it's ridiculous. It's well, how is that different than any other day? Well, I mean, some food, you, you well, know, I mean, some movies you want to maybe just watch a movie, but like, I don't know. It feels like a party kind of atmosphere. You want to get a little tipsy and watch it. It's a you know, party you know. atmosphere. At yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. It's so great. Um, but obviously the movie I was mentioning or referring to, I believe, Eric, it's one of your favorite films of the year. And I believe that's Luca Guadagnino's Challengers. Oh, that's easily my favorite of the year so mm-hmm. far. Okay. You want to say why? Um, 
no he's like yeah you're right Tyler. it's like no and then he just yeah, moves yeah, on yeah, yeah no, I, I think it speaks for itself uh <laughs> no it... like have you seen the three leads that's all you have to say mm-hmm. has you it know, been the movie that we've obsessed about is it the movie that evidently our viewers and listeners have been obsessing about because they keep going back to that that episode where we talked about the sexiest movies of the year and it keeps going back to that one for real right you know there 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 is certainly some appeal to to people uh even if we're in the era of you know gen z puritans that don't like sex and virgins kiss, we're in the era of virgins and all of that um but on the other side this isn't like oh my god horny movies are back it's not the horniest movie ever it's not the sexiest movie ever it's pretty tame by comparison to a lot of things it just has the really perfect chemistry balance though of performance score uh and and visuals that kind of just doesn't it it's it's existing like in in its own place it's so wild because it it like i said it's not it's not really that horny but mm, but it uh, is but it has these sexual moments and these tipping points that are so relatable as you're also watching something that's kind of wild and crazy uh and using tennis as a metaphor which is fine um <laughs> <laughs> and sure. the best and the best ending of any movie so far this year um that final leap over the tennis net is so stupid and <laughs> so hot and I, I i i think i think what i love 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 mike feist in this a lot and his willingness to be so objectified is pretty great. Got him uh, in that bed. Oh my him god! I was going to say I, mean, I knew it was over in the opening moments when yeah. he was rolling around like a slut in that bed. When he like was just like absolute slut, like a big why was old splashy like bottom. Why? Why Ooh. was his back arch like that? Is exactly he, right. He was waiting he for Josh. Exactly what, exactly. He knew exactly what he was doing. But. Yeah. I, I I I really love him in this because his dancing and musical background were so perfect as a tennis player because it 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 lent a a dance quality and a movement quality to the tennis that made it not just like a sports movie. I would never call this a sports movie ever. It it is, but it's not how I would call it. I think you, I, I hope you know what I mean. I know what you mean. Me, I'm just if, I'm just giving you a side side. Yeah, that's all. For me, if I understand the movie, it's not a sports movie. <laughs> no, it's a it's a it's a movie about power dynamics using tennis. It's it's not explaining you tennis at all. Um, it yeah. is. It's not interested in any of anything. It's again, it's about power and love within that whether that is whether love is even a part of it to be fair um and i think feist i've said i've said it since i really want to rewatch the film i think while josh o'connor is the more interesting character of the two leads of the two male leads i think that feist is the more difficult role to play um because he is such a he's so awesome. passive yeah he's, well yeah, yeah but yeah. He's, well, he's very passive in it, and just the way in which he becomes this like little schoolboy by the end, of, you know, and is he's such a you're, yeah, Eric, he is a bottom. Um, by the end, where he's like, I want mommy to cut my meat for me, essentially. Uh, by the end of it, it's uh, yeah, it's incredible, and I think Zendaya is amazing in the film, and uh she's it's all she's a movie star she's just all it's all within her eyes and uh her facial expressions and uh, i think that yeah I, it's the best direction of the year there's things that luca does and luca's already an incredible director to begin with but there are things he does that haven't been done in a tennis movie before um 
the way in which the camera is used as a ball, literally at times, the way, you know, we look under the, the tennis court as they're playing in the middle of the match in the final match. It is for a movie that is a pretty, I mean, it's pretty standard, you know, like it doesn't, you know, there's a lot of dynamics, but like the setup is a pretty standard setup of like these two yeah. guys going after this girl um, and their tennis careers from a visual standpoint, it is ambitious as fuck. And it is a guy like after bones and all after call me by your name, after Suspiria, who has always put 110% into his work. It feels like the best, most expansive thing that he's done so far. And that's what makes me so excited about queer. Cause it's like, Oh, now you gave this guy more money to make a three hour movie like about obsession and longing like, Oh, okay. Sign me the hell up for that. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I, yeah, I, I think it's, I think it's a pretty incredible film and it's aged the best. I think all of them. And um, yeah, Tyler, I, I know that we haven't really talked about it a lot, but I know that other than outside of a couple of texts, but I know you really love the film too, right? Yeah. Oh, I love challengers. Um, I think I did. I did like five backflips in the theater while I was watching it. There are just so <laughs> many moments in that movie that made me did that bother the audience there or was it just you or well no we're in alabama there was no one in the audience um, oh that's fair that's it fair. was just me tyler was just you having know, was a like, fantasy there's like six other people in the audience they're all either you know they thems or queer people definitely everyone losing their minds people gasping at certain scenes so there were there were no heterosexuals in there with us <laughs> well that that's that is fair um, no, I do. I do love the movie, though. I think it's it's probably my number three for the year, but I love it. Number three of the year. OK, well, do you um, well, what is then your number two, if you don't mind me asking? Number two is I saw the TV glow. Re that's your number two. Mm -hmm. I'm shocked that that's your number two. OK, um, you saw this at South by if I'm not mistaken. I did. So I uh, Jane Schoenbrunn gave an introduction. They were talking about it. And I told the guy next to me, I was sitting in the balcony and I told him then I'm going to cry next to you during this movie. And I could kind of tell watching the movie, which is just an odyssey of attempting to understand yourself and find yourself and the courage it takes to be oneself. Um, it's something that I've, I've seen the movie twice. Now I went back and saw it in theaters after it came out in May. Um, it's on my brain pretty much all the time. Um, the ending is a warning, I think, to not being able to be your full self when you cannot realize the potential of who you are versus what your life is when you just cannot be that. Um, and I think for a lot of people, maybe it is maybe a scary ending and it can be considered that way, I think. But in a lot of ways, it is hopeful because it does show the power of being oneself when you're queer, when you're trans, when you have anything that's different about you that you feel like you cannot be. Um, and just finally being able to do that, I think, is something a lot of people understand and feel like they're trapped in a different reality. So that film for me is something that I think about all the time. And that soundtrack is incredible. Eric, I don't think you and I really talked about TV Glow. Have you not seen it yet? I have not seen it. Oh it's, one, it's, it's one of the things that I have not seen that is going to haunt me on this podcast. I will be really interested in to hear what you think of the film i think it is on vod already so you could rent it yeah but i'll i'm not gonna i'm not gonna pay for it spend money um yeah support I'll independent wait, cinema screaming i'll wait till yeah. <laughs> you'll, you'll wait till you get a free screening. although i said that about another title and i just realized it is on streaming now and i didn't see it yet the title love lies bleeding you haven't seen oh, love lies bleeding seen, i said the same thing I am I'm clearly very anti-gay right now because yeah. there are two titles that I have not seen yet. That, that are <laughs> it's not June anymore, so there's no reason to have pride at all. That's right. <laughs> it is July. Pride is over. Thank um, you. For God's sakes, the two of you. Um I saw TV uh, I saw the TV glow uh like a couple months because I Tyler Wynn saw that the night of the Oscars. I was not able to to watch it because I was covering the, the Oscars um thank god south by has changed that so we don't have to deal with that next year but um i was finally able to see it i will say this it's not my favorite film of the year but it is it is the most interesting film i think of the year it's right up there with challengers in terms of um the most uh i think interesting film to talk about of the year 
it's very complex. There's multiple meanings. It's 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 really interesting as a, as a sort of test of what you see going into it because obviously it could be a trans allegory. It can also be how we consume media which is a lot of uh, how I was feeling about it and how our future is going to explore media and our sort of imprint on nostalgia in the past and how that sort of shaped us and how dangerous that can be. Um, I think that the screenplay at times is a little bit uh, repetitive, but I think that that's kind of the point. And, um, and I don't know, every day I kind of log on Twitter. I think about, I saw the TV glow more and more because I see people in the way they talk about movies and it's, uh, scary and dangerous and yeah that's like this is like their number one movie of the year and i'm like i don't think you really understood what that movie was about um and uh but i think it's got a, one of the other endings of the year too that's kind of it's really scary and actually very haunting and um it's a movie that i do do not know if i'm going to rewatch by the end of the year because um because it was a very uh, it, it was a very speechless experience. I walked out. I didn't know how to process it, and it took a couple of days. And much more than anything Oz Perkins has ever done, uh, this movie actually lingers with you, and it is more terrifying. And because I think it's more personal than, uh, and I, so I do think it's the quote unquote scariest movie of the year. Because it's it's not about horror; it's about uh, what what is you're bringing out of it and what you're taking into it. So, um, I yeah. think it's a I think it's a really special film. Yeah, yeah, I cried in the Uber all the way from that screening to the next. <laughs> there was there is one frame of this movie I've seen. Like I said, I've seen it twice, and both times I've seen the movie, it has caused me to immediately go into almost hysterics. Killer soundtrack too, like a phenomenal, insane. It doesn't even phenomenal. make sense how good the soundtrack is. Yeah. I, it is, I think, in movie, Eric, that you, yeah, prioritize the shit out of that and watch that one. I will. It is. It's really um, good. Eric, is there another movie that you that you love from this year that you have oh, seen? I mean, there, there are actually a lot. There's there's a lot of good films. Um, and I think by the time this podcast comes out, I can add one of them on here because it will have been released by then. Okay. Um, and actually, I'll just do that now. And that's Didi. I knew it uh, <laughs> from Sean Wong, um, which I think is so wonderful. It's it is not my my era or generation. Uh, I think he's like 28 or 29. So it was, you know, growing Definitely up, not growing up in the, the 90s, late 90s and early 2000s or mid 2000s uh, with uh aim and myspace and the beginning of youtube and that was you know the for for teens and preteens of, of that time but obviously i was uh an, an adult at that time so i saw it and i knew and understood it but i just love i love almost any coming of age story period i just want to always know and understand things through the the lens and and eyes of somebody else and we certainly have gotten um these kinds of stories many 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 times but are finally kind of branching outside of a very strict white suburban version of them and and i and i think it's all the better for it and joan chen my god what an absolute what a magnificent performance it is so quiet and thoughtful um it's meek but not the performance isn't meek the character is meek um but she is beautiful in this and i loved it she's the best part of the movie for me it's sort of just like this slow burn effect i think that that character has like you know you you kind of feel her because it, it is the same trappings that we've seen before of like a of yeah. a mom taking care of a son and a daughter that's you know about to leave and the grandmother's there i mean we've seen we've literally seen this story multiple times over the last five or six years yeah that's not what makes it special it's that then we get to really spend time through 
her son's perspective of seeing of what this woman has given up to be a mother. And then there's that beautiful moment at the end between the two of them where they're just like eating at McDonald's weirdly enough. And it's beautiful. It's beautiful. And you actually like, you really feel for her and what she's having to go through. And yeah, it's one of the better supporting actress performances of the year. Yeah. Um, and it is a very personal story for, for Wong who's, I mean, he's coming off of making another very personal short story. that got Oscar nominated last year and this is his debut. And it feels very much, um, I feel it's kind of like, uh, <laughs> weirdly, it feels like a lot of the other white older directors that have made their personal coming of age stories over the last couple of years. It felt yeah. very much like a slice of life, sort of wandering plotless, um, coming of age story, which is, which is great because it, it feels very lived in and specific to his time. But it's that relationship that he has with this mom that makes the movie what it is. So it's not my favorite of the year. Cause I mean, we have seen this before, but it is very effective when it's, it's just focused on those two characters and Tyler and I saw that like right next to each other. And I think we were both still pretty affected by that movie's ending and, and crying by the end of it. At least I was, I don't know about Tyler. You know I was. It takes virtually <laughs> nothing for me to start sobbing during a movie. How many movies yeah. did you cry when we were together? Like it was like it, we don't need to talk about that. We don't need to talk about that. Yeah, it was a lot. No, no, no. If, I should, I'm gonna bring tissues <laughs> next year. For reference, if anyone ever, if you're ever sitting next to me in a movie, there's a 75 percent chance I am going to cry in it. I am just a nightmare to be beside. The other 25 percent is he will but scream. I will like say, I remember watching Immaculate with him, and he I will scream. Like, I'll jump. In the he hooted. Yeah, he is. Yeah, it was like out of the seat. I hoot and holler. Uh -huh. That person that screams and the whole theater laughs—that's actually me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, wow. It was yeah, twelve hundred like twelve hundred people hearing you just scream like for no reason is not the best. But <laughs> Dee Dee is amazing, <laughs> and it is really <laughs> to bring it away from my awkwardness. I think watching this movie. <laughs> tapped into the awkwardness I felt growing up with AIM because I I too didn't know how to chat with people on there. I felt so weird about not knowing what to say to my friends and not the anxiety of waiting for them to respond, not knowing how to make new friends when they were older than me, not knowing how to bring them around my parents um, for fear of embarrassment over what? Nothing, pretty much. You know, we get embarrassed by our parents for so many different things that don't actually matter. But I think this actually probably was my number four movie of the year. I love this one. Oh, okay. Look at you putting your number four. Okay. And you're like, oh, I'll just put it in that number four right there. Um, exact, exactly, Eric. Exactly. Just placing I've it. I've got a top five. Right um, I, I'll go. I'll I'll talk about a movie that I know Eric's not going to talk about, and I don't know if Tyler's actually seen it. Um, which is uh my number two film of the year, which is um Furiosa, a Mad Max saga. Um, I really love this film. Um, I don't care what Eric says. Um, I have my review up on the website. I think it's a really great prequel and I'm not a fan of prequels. I don't like prequels at all. And, uh, there's been some other prequels. Actually, it's been a really good year for prequels. Like the quiet place prequel was pretty decent. And, uh, the first omen was a really surprising horror film that came out and that's on Hulu. But no, I just, I really, I think George Miller just kind of throws everything at the screen every time he makes a movie now, because this is literally going to be the last time he's probably ever going to be in this world. And uh, I, I don't know. I just found this sort of odyssey revenge epic to be really the kind of storytelling that I like to see on this grand scale. I think Chris Hemsworth is phenomenal. He's one of the best performances of the year. Um, I think the world building is great. It has one of the, great action sequences of the year when uh, they're on the initial run with the war rig. Uh, there's some quibbles that I've had on the rewatches of it for sure uh, that you have with any sort of prequel, but I, I still really like the film overall. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I mean, it's, it, it is sad that this will be the Miller's last chance to go into the wasteland. Cause it's like, people do not want to see these movies at all. It seems like, uh, but uh, it's still a, a worthy film that, never was going to be fury road and never will be. And that's okay. Cause I can appreciate this movie for what it is. So yeah, that's what I have to say about that. No, nothing, no notes from Eric, obviously. Uh, 
and hated it. And uh, and then Tyler hasn't. Tyler, have you seen? I it? haven't seen it, but I'm really excited. I love Fury Road. Okay, I, I think it's on. I think it'll be on Max pretty soon. So um, by next, it month. should be in the dollar bin uh, DVD store. All right. Okay. Um, well, as you're eating cherries, um, Tyler, what was your number one film of the year? Oh, oh my God. I love this movie so much. I want to watch it pretty much every day for the rest of my life. It is so good. Um, when, oh my God. Okay. I'm just going to say it. I love Sing Sing. When I wake up every day, I am thinking about Coleman Domingo and Sing Sing. One of the best performances of this year it premiered, I think, at TIFF last year, and it's finally getting its release for everybody to see. This movie affected me so incredibly. I just could not handle how much empathy is coming from Domingo and every other actor. You know, a lot of these actors are re- not actors, you know, so that always can be kind of tricky when you bring real people into a situation like this. The line drawn between our artistic endeavors towards how we feel about freedom is so fascinating to watch. And it's just so, I cried throughout this whole movie, just at the pure joy of watching these men be able to feel themselves again, feel really powerful emotions in the midst of bleak situations, being being in prison. And it just, I can't get over this movie. I hope everyone watches it and I hope it drives right into Oscar season. I think it's one of our, the year's best. And I truly think Coleman Domingo is one of our best actors and he proves it every time he's on screen. I really like the film. I, I saw it um, recently. I think it's I think it's a good movie. Um, I I like a lot of the first half of it, where it is this sort of we're just kind of putting the camera behind these actor these you know these um, these actors as they're inside this world where they're they're prisoners, but they're also creating art. And it felt it felt almost documentarian at times in that first half. I think what I had more of an issue with is the, is the second half where it does become more of a narrative and there's more of like a story between um, Coleman Domingo's character and the um, the other actor that's in the film, uh, the other main actor. Do you guys remember his name? Clarence Macklin. Thank you very much. Um, when it becomes like about either one of them getting out of prison, I it kind of the film kind of loses its momentum for me, but I think it's beautifully shot. And I think Coleman Domingo, when he's the best thing in the movie period. Um, And uh, I think that whenever he's not on screen, that movie suffers from lack of having uh, a real force and talent like Domingo on screen. And um, yeah, I mean, my audience that saw it, they ate it up. They, they were crying uh, and everything. And, uh, and I was just like, yeah, that was good. It's a good little drama. Good for a 24. Um, and I hope that Domingo's back in the best actor race, but, um, um, you know, it's like number 17 for me on the year. So, so let me be very clear. You said that you started losing interest when they started getting closer to being released from jail. Well, Is because it, well, it's because it takes away from then it being more about the theater troupe and being about the collection of these actors and what they all bring together. And it becomes then just centralized on those two characters more than it does about everybody else. And that's where, um, that's when I started to be like, Oh, this is when it's starting to turn into a story about these two rather than about the group, which is much more interesting story for me. I know. It kind of sounds like you just wanted these men to stay in prison. Well, yeah, I, mean, the, about I mean, the movie only cares. I mean, in the second half of the movie, the movie only cares about those two getting out of prison and the rest of them not. So like, let's, let's talk about that. If you're going to, if you're going to turn it around on me, then the movie doesn't want to give a shit about those people. By the way, we're getting out. You're stuck here forever. You're going to die in prison. Congratulations. Well, like, because that's actually, that's kind of how it goes. You sometimes are chosen and sometimes you are not. And in the prison system, it's those stakes are as high as they can possibly be. So that sort of almost lottery feeling yeah. that these men have, where you also have to be happy for somebody else while understanding that your own future is absolutely fucked. I can't imagine a more selfless act to be able to be happy for somebody else in a moment like that. It takes a while for, for, for yeah. Domingo's character to get like that. And it's because he's yes. 
Yeah. And also his process, his, his like, um, uh, like incarceration meeting or whatever. Um, that scene where that woman gives hearing. Yeah. When she's like, when she says one of the lines of the year, that is one of the most gut punch lines I've heard in a movie in a while where she accuses him of something. Yeah. Uh, I do not want to spoil it for people, but when she accuses him of, sorry, I, my mouth was again on the floor. I was shocked that, uh, they went to that level of honesty. Also thing to, um, Sean San, um, Sean San Jose, uh, Jose as Mike, Mike incredible should be getting just as much attention 100%. for his work in this movie. He broke my fucking heart. And that's another part is that in the second half of the film, it doesn't focus on him either anymore. And uh, it's super sad, but he is phenomenal in this movie, yeah, just as good as Domingo. Great. And he's yeah. very much like like that in real life. It's which is really <laughs> funny. Um, he's one of Coleman Domingo's very best friends. They've known each other for like 25 years. Uh, so their scenes together, they wrote together. Wonderful. Wonderful yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yep. Every Everyone in it is great. Yeah. yeah Eric, it's, I love them. Yeah. Uh, Eric, you have another film you want to mention? Maybe yeah, I mean, I know I, I know I said earlier that, you know, I'm struggling to, you know, find a list, but I do have a lot of films and performances that uh, I absolutely you can just have, talk about them loosely have, more now. Yeah, yeah. I've loved uh, I can't. Uh, we have to talk about Janet Planet. <clears throat> I haven't from, seen Janet Planet. So am I the only one that has seen it? I think you've you're yeah, the only yeah, one. So yeah, I'll, I'll I want to real quick. Then it actually premiered at Telluride last year. And but it was I, one of the movies I, I, I missed. I missed it, yeah. and I didn't see it until this year. And it came out this summer. Uh, from Annie Baker, her first film. Uh, Julianne Nicholson, uh, kind of hippy dippy mother in the woods, uh, and daughter, first time actress Zoe Ziegler. Two of the best performances of the year, hands down, not even close. Absolutely uh, magical, beautiful, funny. Um, also, Will Patton, uh, Sophie Okonedo. I I love this movie so so much. Oh, Tyler, you are gonna love Janet Planet. I feel like I am. I'm getting so excited about it. Like when I watch any read anything about it, I feel like it is specifically made for me. It's it's yeah. The child performance from Zoe Ziegler absolutely knocks me out. So funny and matter of fact, I've been uh, dying to not watch precocious it. at all. Man, it was one of those that we missed at Telluride, and it was nowhere else. And I've been dying to see it. And, and um, yeah, and it's it's on the it's high on the the watch list to catch up for by the end of the year. Um, anything else, Eric? Um. Yes. Um, another uh, Josh O'Connor masterpiece uh, <laughs> came out t- technically in the U.S. this year was uh, La Chimera from mm-hmm. Alicia Warwalker. Warwatcher. Um, perfect, amazing, Keystone st- Cops kind of comedy, uh, silly, funny, but also wonderfully deep and sad. O'Connor, what a year. What a performance. And yeah. he's beautiful in this dirty, just vulnerable. Oh my God. Everything. Yeah. I love him. So it's the so best. Fun. It's the best Indiana Jones movie to come out in the last two years. I'll tell you that. I'm telling you. Mm-hmm. It's. Yeah. Freaking rule. It, it freaking rules. Yeah. It's it's it, it takes, it took me a while when I first watched it to kind of get in its groove. But then by the end, I was I was like like about halfway through, I was hooked. It's such a good movie. I was able to see it finally at AFI last year. Um, it premiered at 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 Telluride, where uh, Roll Rocker got the uh, a special uh, prize uh, medallion, I believe. If no, it premiered at Can. Oh, yes. it premiered at Can, but she was, but she did get something. Yeah, probably. but she got she got the medallion uh, at Telluride. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. But uh. Yeah. Go catch it. It's on video on demand, I believe. I believe, um, and since it's a neon film, it should be on Hulu as its streaming debut. And if uh, you're like us, you'll get it in a box set uh, later this year. If not, no, you, also, yeah, I, yeah, also yeah. that too. 
Um, it was in last year's box set, wasn't it? Oh, it was in it in last year? year? Oh, okay. Yeah, well, yeah. then go back and watch that. It's in your box set. Yeah. Um, I want to mention Ghostlight. Yes. Which is a phenomenal film. It was one of the biggest surprises, I think, of the year. Um, Alex Thompson and Kelly O'Sullivan's a film about this family who use uh, a local production of Romeo and Juliet to essentially come back together after the loss of their son. I think it's incredible acting. Uh, I think it was really funny. I have to tell this story really quick. I was going to get my ticket at South by and pick it up to go into the theater um, from the, one of the uh, reps that was covering the film. And I walk up to the front and um, they're like, if you go around uh, the guy has got it with your ticket and the guy gave me my ticket, he was super nice and everything. I went to my seat. I sat down. And uh, the person at South by introduced the film and brought out the two directors. And it was Alex Thompson, the co-director of this film that gave me my ticket to walk into the film. I was, <laughs> that's how kind of like off guard. And then I realized that, uh, you know, O'Sullivan and Thompson, they are the team responsible uh, for a film called uh, St. Francis, which I really loved a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, it was in 2020 and they had the little baby with them and they talked about this yes. movie and they were super nice. We talked after the film uh, came out and what a beautiful film. What a, you know, Keith uh, Kepfer, uh, a phenomenal lead actor performance. Dolly DeLeon, incredible. This whole family is incredible in this movie. This is one of those where it's, again, it's a very simple story, but it's all about how these actors convey these emotions. It's not manipulative at all. It's super indie film. If you can catch it on video on demand when it comes out or in your area, if it's still in a small, small theater, please do watch it. it it's a great partner with Sing Sing, I believe, um, about two movies that are just showcasing what theater can mean in various different circumstances. Um, don't know if it's going to like, you know, either film will solve the world or anything, but um, I do think that they're really uh, beautiful films and uh, yeah, big surprise. Tyler, I don't know if you, did you catch it? at No, you didn't catch it at South by. No, I um, didn't catch it. I really want to see this movie though. Yeah. Eric, Eric, you saw it earlier this, after I saw it. And um, we talked, yeah, you know. yeah, I saw it up here at the Alexander Valley Film Festival. And yeah, the directors there were there with their baby in tow. Um, Super cute family who, who makes a cameo in the film. Mm-hmm. In, They're like right in the back. Yeah. In the mother. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> funny. Kelly. I love this movie so much. Uh, Dolly De Leon is incredible. Amazing. Uh, the way that it uses Romeo and Juliet as not a direct parallel, but an adjacent one for the death of somebody young is extraordinary. Yeah. And so compelling. It's like, and I love that this family is a real family yeah. in real life. That can be a very tricky thing and, and pretty stunty, but their dynamic is, is spectacular. Yeah. I think that, Kit Connor and Rachel Zegler and Tom Holland should watch this movie and be like, we should not make Romeo and Juliet's on stage anymore. Like, just maybe cut it. It's out. also really, really funny too. Yeah, it's a really funny movie, and it's like, all it just a, getting getting over, like passed over. Oh my god! It's also just a movie so about found, found found families and and how you can and how you you know you find them when you need them the most. So I think that that's really beautiful. Um, Tyler, did you have another film you wanted to talk about? Uh, I think the last film I'll talk about today is uh, Babes, which is something I I still need to watch again. I think Babes is so funny. Um, I why would you Why would you have liked to talk about Babes? Any Any can't believe we, we haven't yet because yeah. Any particular reason why you want to talk about Babes? Like because it's the comedy of the year. You heard mm. me the first, second, and third time. Yeah, it is it, so funny. And Michelle Buteau is giving. We should be casting Michelle Buteau in everything. Yes, she is an actual star. We already knew that she was funny, but being able to clearly lead this movie, there's some of the funniest dialogue of the year in this movie. I cannot stop saying, "Are you the Gordon Ramsay of my pussy?" I cannot. <laughs> um, 
this movie is so funny and it's actually so heartfelt just in a really strict sense about just how relationships work. And especially when you become either a parent or you just have responsibility over someone else and how that can shift the dynamic between you and someone you're close to. Um, but I think these two women are just amazing together in this movie. And I just loved it. I love it too. Um, Eric hasn't seen it. Um, right, Eric, you haven't, you haven't caught it. I have not. Well, maybe you should buy a Blu-ray of it. It, it, It'll say that it's the comedy of the year. Oh, I might. might. And it might have like, I don't know, your freaking website on it. And, uh, you know, and you, you you'd be like, well, and then uh, that was my quote. Um, No, it's, I, I had a great time with it. It was actually kind of needed at that point of South by because we were two or we're like a day and a half in and we hadn't seen anything good. Me and Tyler and we saw it and we were cracking up. And then it's one of those other things too, about seeing movies at the Paramount there at South by is when a comedy really works and you've got 1200 people laughing at the same time. Uh, it's, it's pretty, and it's a pretty incredible experience. And uh, it's one, yeah. One of the great comedies of the year so far. Um I wanted to briefly just talk about National Anthem, the Guilford's film uh, that just just came out into theaters. A pretty great, another one of those coming of age films, another one about finding yourself in found families and everything. Uh, I recently talked to Guilford about the film and that interviews up at awardswatch.com. Um, I think this movie's beautiful. Talk about one of the most beautiful looking films of the year period. Just shot incredible. And that's no surprise. It's this famed photographer. Um, but, you know, taking his sort of his book about uh, his in-depth look into the queer rodeo scene and making it about this young man who starts working at, uh, uh, you know, on a, in and around with queer rodeos and ranchers um, and finds, uh, you know, a crush and who he is. Um both personally and sexually is it, it's a beautiful film. Um, and one of the, the good coming of age stories that we've had in a while and doesn't try to play too hard. I think on the cliches as much as it's just about these people. And, uh, and I think that, uh, yeah, it's one of the better directorial debuts, if not the best I've seen so far this year. So, um, I really, really loved it. And it's it was a movie that I saw last year in preparation for uh for a South by Southwest and had taken its time to get all the way back to us this year. So um it was one of the ba- best surprises last year, one of the better surprises this year still too. Yeah, I love National Anthem as well. It Tyler, is Tyler, you gotta catch this one. It is lovely. Yeah. I wanna see it. It's yeah. beautiful. Eric, do you have anything else? I do. Uh, keeping on the queer train, because National Anthem is a super queer movie. Um, I really loved Solo uh, from Sophie uh, Dupuy. And with one of my favorite performances of the year, and that's Theodore Pellerin. Um, Montreal drag queen and... Uh, struggling relationship with his mother and caustic romance with a horrible guy that is just all red flags uh fabulous loved it loved it loved it um and then also the good uh glenn powell movie of 2024 (laughs) and that is hitman hell yeah hilarious sexy super sexy super funny um even though i think glenn powell was the best part of twisters uh i did not like twisters and that kind of is maybe why i said earlier that this year feels so weirdly like soft and that's mostly because the bigger movies this year for me have all been disappointments not for everybody and a lot of people are on the opposite side. I didn't like Curiosa. I didn't like Maxine. I didn't like Twisters. You like Dune. I like Dune. Yeah. yeah I, I like I'm Dune. not I'm not on the Dune train. You know that. But but yeah, Hitman is where it's at for Glenn Powell for me. Absolutely yeah. hilarious performance. It's one of Linklater's best movies in the last 10 years, easily. Oh. Um low bar, it, yes. No, he's got some interesting cut it out. <laughs> 
He's got some in, in the last 10 years. He's got some very interesting films. It's my opinion. Yeah. Well, what does it <laughs> matter? Um, Tyler, you've seen Hitman and right. Like you have you not seen it? No, no, you. I don't want to have to do this on this podcast, but you oh. know how I feel about Glenn Powell. Oh, for God's sakes, get over it and watch a good movie. You know, you have to watch just se- listed good movies. I mean, you you watch like he season looks- three. You watch season three of The Bear, and then you won't watch a good movie like those. Like, okay, all right. I'm just saying. Oh, I do so- want to be friends with Glenn Powell, though. He seems like a very sweet man. Well, you're not going to be friends with him if you're not watching his movies. Come on, no, oh, he doesn't care. No, yeah, I think he does. Um, uh, Tyler, did you see Dune? Um, no, I have not okay. seen Dune. Either. Okay, I'm the sure. It's like five hours long, and it's just I don't have time. I'm I have TV to watch. Yeah, uh, you have. What was that? What's that Rashida Jones show on Apple that you're obsessing about Funny. right now? So I didn't obsess, yeah. Okay, hold on. We don't have to do this, but I didn't. It's like what? Like that's what? Like really forty five hours worth of that show that no, no one's going to talk about in about six about months? Ten, no, it's only about five to six hours. It's ten episodes. Okay. Sure, I'm sure everybody's gonna be talking about that in about like six months. But the difference is, after three episodes, I can just stop when I want to, and it doesn't feel like I've ended the story at a weird point. That's fair. I mean, you could just watch like 30 minutes of movies, see if you're into it or not. No. Yeah, people do that all the time. Not That's me. weird. Well, yeah. no, I'm just saying. Um, that sounds like oh, I, I want to try this alcohol, so I'll take a full shot of it. <laughs> That's fair. Um. I do want to talk uh, just briefly problemista, which I think yes. is really great, which I think is really great. No one's talking about it because they just dumped it on yes. streaming and, and out of the theaters and Julio Torres is amazing. Tilda Swinton, incredible. We're going to be in the year of Tilda this year with two other films and this. So I do not want this to be ignored. She's phenomenal in this movie. Yeah. Uh, it's great with babes as both of like the comedies of the year. Um, Evil does not exist. Yep, which is a which is a movie oh, that Eric that, yeah. Eric was very positive at a at a tiff for. I was very mixed on it, but then I, God, I keep thinking about that movie, Eric, more and more as the year has gone on, and I, I I've so come around on it. Good, yeah. Another movie that is coming out, or it was was out, I believe, is Tuesday. I love Tuesday. Yeah, we love Tuesday out of yeah. Telluride. That also, an A twenty four movie that's just like blip, blip. We're <laughs> just gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna put this here, and nobody's gonna know. Really great movie about grief and death, and uh, very interesting for a debut. I think very ambitious for a debut. Um, not one of the worst movies you'll see um, for sure. It's very. I love it. Julie Dreyfus, incredible, absolutely amazing. My queen. Um. Talk about a fun movie I saw at South by with Tyler or no, I don't know if Tyler was Tyler. Were you there the night we saw monkey man? Did we see monkey man together? Yeah. yeah um, that Patel structural debut, just a lot of fun, good, solid action movies. Probably one of the best, if not the best action uh, movie that we've had this year, I think, because from a visual standpoint, it's, it's, it, it's very consistent and it's very vibrant and it's beautiful. And I think, um, now all of it works 100%, but Patel, you can tell has an eye for this and, and could be, you know, somebody that um, like his producer, Jordan Peele could be in this directorial chair a couple more times and it wouldn't be the worst thing to see. Um, so yeah. Um, any, anything else? Any other movies? You guys want to um, I want to shout out just a couple of performances that are better than the movies that okay. they're in okay um and that's jesse plemons in both civil war and kinds of kindness yeah he's uh, he it's is been the year of plemons he is better than in the movies that he's in of of both of those um even though you know i i liked a lot of both of those movies but he is he's the cream of the crop um Nell tiger free in the first omen that movie is batshit and really fantastic yeah, that's a great prequel. Very, co- very cool. Yeah, very cool movie. Yeah. If you if you think that you can be tired of prequels and understandably so, sometimes there's a good one. The better version of Immaculate. Oh, yeah. I didn't see Immaculate. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Sorry, Sydney Sweeney. <laughs> um, yeah. let's see. I 
I love Owen Teague in Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. Hell yes. Great performance. Um, uh, it's also, yes, smash, smash, smash. Um, <laughs> that's actually, I think, everything from my list. Oh, Lily Gladstone and Fancy Dance, too. I need to rewatch Fancy Dance. It's um, good. I want to shout out uh, Olivia Coleman and Jesse Buckley for their swearing in Wicked, right. in Wicked Little Letters. In Wicked Little Letters. Wicked Little Letters. Wicked Letters. Um, I want to shout out Aaron Taylor Johnson in The Fall Guy because I think that he's incredible in that movie and making the fun. The big movie I hated this year. I know you hated that movie, Eric. But, so many. What but is I wrong? Think, but I think he's actually great and kind of making fun of the Cruz McConaughey oh, he's, uh, sort of he's superstars. Actor. Yeah. I really need to rewatch that movie and see if it's as good as I remember it being. Um, and uh, yeah, I would like to shout out Conor McGregor for one of the worst performances I've seen in a while in Roadhouse. Mm-hmm. Jake, that's, keep make- that's, a, that's a TV movie, so we're not going to talk about that. Jake, keep making those choices. We love seeing it. Um, How dare you? Argyle, worst movie, uh, worst movie of the year with a cat in it. Um, my poor cat, even though it's digital, right? Um, yeah, there's, I mean, uh, I would say another great performance, a small performance in a movie that not a lot of people seen. Um, but Gabriel LaBelle's really good in uh, Snack Shack. Have you guys seen that? I seen that? actually just started that two nights ago and turned it off because I hated you it. Hated it? <laughs> okay. Yes. He's good. The movie is very cliched and very just like, yeah, but like if you watch it all the way through, he's These two actually- kids don't know how to smoke. It was so fucking annoying. <laughs> I wanted to punch them both in the face. And the whole opening is just them like smoking and gambling. I'm like, you guys are 12. I loved it. What are you, what are you doing? It's not a, it's not a, like a great movie, but it, it oh, clearly his, his performance is very good. And I, I will it's attest to that. Bad. So uh, Tyler, anything else for you? Um, I just wanted to shout out Stephen McKinley Henderson also for Civil War. I liked him a lot in that movie, even though I did not love that movie. I thought he was incredible in it. He's that's, great in that. That's an evergreen statement. Oh, yeah. yeah. He pretty much. If he's in a movie, guaranteed I loved him in it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, I mean, Sorry to everyone else in the frame. It's just a shame that they cut him from Doom Part 2. Shame on Denis Villeneuve for cutting him out. Fucking asshole. You don't cut out Stephen McKinley Henderson, you don't do that. No. He makes uh, everything better. And I know we mentioned Roadhouse, so I will give a special shout out to that one frame where Jake Gyllenhaal is in bed and he kind of twists and he looks like a Renaissance painting. That's one of the most yeah. beautiful things I've ever seen. Speaking uh, of one, uh, one of the more, tell you that I did a freeze frame on that. Uh, my, yeah, I don't want to know what you did with you that. You can believe me. <laughs> uh, speaking of uh, two really good guys, uh, Henry Cavill and. Alan Richardson in uh, the Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare. Didn't uh, see it. Really fun movie. Um, Guy Ritchie. I agree with Jay's review. It's a fun time. Um, when Ritchie makes good movies, they're fun. And it's. When's that? F- Most of the time. He's a good director. You Is should, he? You should, yeah, he's pretty good. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. He's, he's not making like prestige movies, but he's making good movies. Hmm. Oh, okay. He, he works with Jake Gyllenhaal a lot. It's <laughs> there you go. How, exactly. How dare you? To the point. <laughs> Actually, right. that's not a bad movie. That in that movie What the the Covenant? The Covenant. It's not yeah, bad. It's, it's not good either. But it is very know. white savior. Yeah, you think? Um okay. That's kind of the best of the year. It's kind of sad. Um, but like that's it. You no, know, I think the more we got into it, I think the more we kind of opened up the 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 possibilities because there there is a lot of good stuff but i mean again when i look at my list these are all tiny movies mostly yeah. tyler i got a question for you this is the mm-hmm. big last question would you rather watch and you have to pick one would uh-huh. you rather watch furiosa doom part two or and those together or watch horizon part one and part two <laughs> horizon part one and part two Really? Because why? Because oh. it's because it's like because oh. it's like television show. <laughs> Absolutely not. Okay. 
I would rather watch than Horizon Part Two. I would sit down and watch Florence Foster and Jenkins twice in a row. <laughs> wow! Wow! A movie I don't know if anyone knows. I am actually allergic to. I cannot make it through that movie without falling asleep, which I know is not a huge high bar for me, but I cannot do it. Lawrence Foster Jenkins. Yep. That's wow. Bad, yeah, it's a terrible movie. Yes, um, it is. Yeah, they play that in Guantanamo Bay, from what I hear. Um, anyway, Tyler, can you tell everyone where they can find you and all your work on the internet? And can you give us uh, one or two of your most anticipated films left this year that's going to come out? Yes. Um, you can find all my work at awardswatch.com. You can find me on Twitter at Tyler Foster. We still have some Emmy stuff coming up. Now that the nominations are out, lots more TV stuff. Um, as of right now, I'm going to say, and this is probably once again, not a shock to anybody. I am most excited for Maria. Um, anything about a woman that could have a tragic story. I am. I mean, that's it. That's it. And it has mother Angelina Jolie in it. I could not be more excited. I, and I love Pablo Lorraine. So this is it for me. Please go give uh, a, a read to all of Tyler's stuff. He's doing a ton of stuff during the Emmys, predictions, interviews, you name it. He's doing it. There'll probably be another Emmy podcast with Eric and Tyler coming out soon. Yes. Um, maybe. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe it'll come out. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Tyler, <laughs> thank you so much. Eric, where can we find, uh, I guess, find all you and your work? Uh, well, wait, did you ask Tyler where we can find his? Yeah, I already, that's, I, yeah, I that's what he that. did. Yeah, the whole thing is, where's all your work? And then what's your movie you're most anticipating? See, listening oh, skills, ladies part. and gentlemen, are not part. part of the Awards Watch team sometimes. We have to work on those. Um, um Okay, well, you can find me at awardswatch.com, obviously, uh, or hopefully. Um and God, I hope so. I hope, <laughs> like, I are, hope, you, are you I okay? You want... <laughs> I, I got nervous. I know. That sounds like my grandmother saying, Lord willing. You know, Something like, like that. Yeah, exactly. Bless your um, soul. Yeah. <laughs> Shut up. But bless her heart. Bless her heart is right. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. So, wordswatch.com. Uh, at awards underscore watch on Twitter and awards watch everywhere else. Uh, newsletter, which is kind of like really once a week right now, but we'll, be, we'll, we'll amp it back up to two. It's going to be two a week soon. I think soon. Um, yeah, Emmy Emmy stuff will be in full force during August uh, before we get into the fall festivals. Um, most anticipated. This is this is a long list because I know, but this, you only get you know, two. I'll I'll get as many as I want because I am the boss. I'll edit them out of the show. It doesn't um, matter because I will also piggyback on Maria because hello. Wow. Well, I mean. That's kind of rude to just jump on top of a woman. No. Okay. I'm just, oh, off the pick. Oh, okay. That's just mean. I don't even want to piggyback. You might hurt her. I'm, I'm just going to, I'm just going to need you to mute like for a second. Um, Let's see. Queer, obviously, which we talked about. Uh, Night Bitch, which I'm surprised that Tyler did not mention. So I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. Night Superhero Bitch. Superhero movie of the year. I don't know what it is. Y'all know what it is. Um, and Gladiator 2. Shocking. Mm. I know. You can find me on a, a Twitter, Instagram, Letterboxd, at Ryan McQuaid 77 You can find all my work here at awardswatch.com. If you like podcasts, we have our Director Watch podcast where we are in the middle or towards the end, actually, I guess, of the Tony Scott movie series. We're going to be discussing Deja Vu this coming week, which will be great. Um, it feels like we already talked about it um because that's a little bit of deja vu um <laughs> uh yeah itunes spotify five star reviews newsletter all that stuff please go sign up for it uh eric eric uh, maybe he'll do three times a week when when we get into the fall festival just to just to mess with you guys yeah because um, i need more work during the festivals work uh anyway um most anticipated movie uh I'm really looking forward to queer and gladiator Two. Eric stole my pick. That's not a surprise. Um, your pick as if my, gladiator two could be your pick. Uh, not everything in the world. Paul Meskel is yours and everything in the world of Fun Denzel fact, Washington is. is mine. Um, 
yeah because he's the real star of that movie um is denzel washington um yeah um i i oh kind of think of some Same other films too because that's what that's what your answer is right well yeah wicked one right uh oh it's a complete unknown what are you talking about um <laughs> i actually really am interested in conclave and seeing that and the end from joshua oppenheimer uh those are movies that uh i i really hope to see uh and hard truths because i really love mike lee and uh and i don't know why that's only going to Toronto. Uh, maybe it's bad. And also Blitz. I'm going to throw in Blitz. I really do want to see Steve McQueen's new film. Uh, I love McQueen. He's one of our great directors that we have. And we don't have a lot of like veteran auteur directors really leading the pack this year. So I'm really looking forward to that. That's going to be later in the year, though. Uh, most likely probably in November is when I'm where my, most of us are going to be able to see that though. That is premiering at the London um, film festival later in October. So lots of great films to look forward to. I expect when we do our best of the year episode, we probably, if if we're talking about the same films here, uh, it was not a good year in my opinion. Then at that point, and then no, I disagree. Point. If we're talking about what we, what we just talked about here and they have, withstood i don't think it's a bad year i i i disagree i think i love when 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 the first half of the year can have movies that that stick with you yeah but i like i like it to be a mix like if we're only talking about these movies then yes the year was not good that would be wild that would be wild yeah it would rarely happen but um um it'll be especially with night bitch coming out yeah i mean god it's like I mean, Amy Adams Warriors, we are here. Yeah, her playing a superhero, just waiting for it. So she anyway, always plays a superhero. That's fair. That's fair. Even in Batman vs Superman, which she's terrible. And anyway, thank you all so much for listening, and we'll see you all next time. <laughs>